great. Welcome. Absolutely uh, blown away and thrilled that we have such a great audience here tonight. Thank you all for making your way down here um, and finding your way in. I know the gallery, well, I've learned the gallery's closed on Mondays, which is kind of crazy. Um, part of the idea of having our lectures here is to get some of our student population familiar with some of the resources here in Ottawa, and it doesn't help much when the gallery's closed, but we have a long tradition of doing our forum lectures on Monday evenings, and we might have to rethink that if we're, uh, if we're gonna stay at this venue. So my name is Ben Johnny. I'm a associate professor in the School of Architecture and Urbanism uh, at Carleton University, and I'm involved in organizing this year's series. And as you can see, based on the uh, little chart up there, we are on uh, the, uh, the uh, fifth of six lectures as part of the official series uh, this year. Um, we are adding a mini series within our larger uh, lecture series, which is to say that somewhere between lecture tonight and the lecture on Monday, March 6th, we have a four-part series on housing affordability for millennials that we'll be staging over at the um, Carlton Dominion Chalmers Center. And I think uh, you'll be, if you're on our mailing list, you'll get some information about that too. So I encourage you guys to come, to everyone to come forward and, and participate in that if you are so inclined. Um, but within the official series, we are at lecture five of six. Uh, we've really been running the gamut over the course of the last several months, um, and the, um, we are, uh, as you probably know, officially our title is the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism. In our undergraduate program, we have three specializations. One is design, which is what we would more traditionally consider architecture, the um, design of new buildings. We have conservation and sustainability, which focuses on the adaptive reuse of the existing building stock and deals with heritage and uh, preservation issues or conservation issues. And then we also have an urbanism stream. So what we try to do in our lecture series is to hit those three areas. So um, we, two of the, uh, the first, well, the second and the third lecture were really focused on, on, um, on conservation and sustainability. Um, and the, uh, the, the, th the fourth and the fifth and uh, lecture are focused really on urban issues. So last, last lecture we had uh, three uh, representatives of the sort of for-profit um, world of building housing. And then this lecture we're actually shifting laterally a little bit and really looking at the not-for-profit sector. And specifically we're, we're, we're zeroing in on housing for uh, Canada's indigenous population. So those of you who might not have read it, the description that we have is comprised of Inu, uh, First Nations people and Métis, uh, Canada's indigenous population is heterogeneous. And while many live in traditional and remote communities, the majority live in the country's largest cities where they face familiar issues of supply and affordability. And this session explores the unique social, cultural, and logistical challenges associated with the design and construction, uh, not to mention the uh, uh, financing, uh, of housing for indigenous peoples, both within and beyond their traditional communities. And it explores new approaches and supports that validate the position and perspectives of indigenous people as they contribute to the evolving experience of being Canadian. So tonight I'm extremely pleased. Oh, first I should acknowledge before we get too much further our uh, support from our founding sponsors, uh, Trinity Developments, Merkley Supply, Charles Fort Developments, uh, GRC Architects, and I think John is here from GRC. There might be some others, which is great. Uh, Hoban Architecture. I think Gord is here from Hoban uh, Architecture. There he is, yes, hopefully some others. Uh, and then uh, Arcadis uh, IBI Group. So IBI was recently acquired by Arcadis. Uh, and so we have updated our logo to, uh, to uh, um, reflect that as well. So thank you very much to the, the sponsors. It's, it's, we couldn't do this without you, and it's the gift that keeps on giving. Tonight we have three speakers. Um, Mark Markle, Jake Chakasim, and David Fortin all of whom have slightly different perspectives, uh, but all of whom are deeply involved in the issue of housing for uh, Canada's indigenous population. The format tonight will be, we're gonna ask Mark to come forward, uh, just give a brief introduction, uh, tell us a little bit about how uh, Canada's indigenous population is, com is composed and how it's distributed. Uh, then we'll turn it over to Jake, uh, who will set the scene for some of the issues, and then finally to David, um, who will give a presentation um, as well, and uh, assuming we have time, and I, those of you who were here last time, we realized we ran out of time, 
uh, we are going to spend the last half hour uh, with discussion. Uh, so the three chairs there <laughs> hopefully will be filled by the end of the, the, uh, the evening and we can have some great discussion. So I, I think I'll just go ahead and introduce all three um, uh, first. So first we're going to start with Mark Maracle. Mark is a Mohawk uh, from the Tenendaga Mohawk Territory. He's been involved with First Nations and Indigenous issues over the course of his 38-year professional career. His initial background was in architectural design and preparation of construction documents and capital project management. His background also includes community development, economic development program, project design uh, and management, program project evaluation, negotiation of federal transfers of program management, communications, facilitation, conflict resolution, and strategic planning. I got in touch with Mark a few weeks back and he said, ah, I got a cold. I got called out to go up to Confederation Heights to figure out what to do with all of the federal buildings up there. So he's called upon a lot to do a lot of different things. He's really uh, uh, an amazing resource uh, for our community here. Now, Mark has worked as a private consultant, a senior policy analysis, sorry, senior policy advisor with the National Aboriginal Management Board at Human Resources and Development Canada, and as the executive director of the National Association of Friendship Centers. Mark joined Gignall Housing as the executive director in the spring of 2004. Gignall is uh, probably the largest indigenous, not-for-profit indigenous housing provider here in Ottawa. Um, and a number of you may have done work for Gignall. I know uh, CSV is doing work for you now uh, and, and others as well. Um, they're building, as we speak, a number, uh, I mean, a, a complex of housing right at the end of my street. Um, Mark recently stepped down as co-chair of the Ontario not-for-profit housing association, Indigenous Advisory Housing Committee, as well as Canada's Housing and Renewal Association's Indigenous Caucus. And Mark is the former co-chairperson for the Ottawa Aboriginal Coalition and the former co-chair of the Urban Indigenous Strategy Coalition Council. Mark has also served as the co-chair of the Aboriginal Working Committee, a, a relationship with the City of Ottawa, and he has served as a coach and assistant coach for both girls and boys hockey. Uh, at the Carlton Place Minor Hockey Association and as a volunteer with the Carlton Place uh, Canoe Club. A lot, uh, a lot uh, to commend him and to talk about. So Mark will be our first presenter tonight. Then we will move to, uh, to Jake Chakasim. Um, those of you at the school know Jake. He's joined our faculty fairly recently, and we're extremely pleased to have him. Jake is a Cree from the uh, Muskegawak Territory, situated in northern Ontario also known as Treaty 9 or the James Bay Treaty. He's assistant professor at the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism and a doctoral candidate at UBC's School of Community and Regional Planning. And his research focuses on resiliency, the internal migration and displacement of indigenous communities, and the formulation and of an etymology of indigenous design for schools of architecture in Canada. In tandem with these scholarly activities, he's worked and collaborated with firms in Ontario and in uh, British Columbia. Jake is an active member of the RAIC Indigenous Task Force and is currently involved with the development of a national architectural policy for Canada that centralizes uh, the valued inclusion of Canada's Indigenous peoples, presence, livelihood, and well-being across the built environment. And then our third speaker tonight uh, is uh, David Fortin, who has driven in from the University of Waterloo today. Thank goodness this was a sunny day, not a snowy day. David is a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario and a member of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada Indigenous Task Force. The ITF, the Indigenous Task Force, seeks ways to, uh, quote, foster and promote Indigenous design in Canada. From 2018 and 2019, David coordinated a community-led housing design project with the National Research Council uh, for remote northern communities and has also participated as a mentor uh, and architect for Indigenous Homes Innovation Initiative uh, administered by Indigenous Services Canada. David is a professional architect who runs a small architectural office working primarily with Métis and First Nations communities across Canada. He's currently, as I mentioned, a professor at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture. David, as you uh, might already know, is also part of the Architects Against Housing Alienation, the AAHA, that will represent Canada uh, in the 18th International Architecture Exhibition at the Biennale of Venice from May 20th uh, to November 26th this year, so coming up soon. So we uh, welcome all three. So with that, oh, have a little round of applause. Okay. Great. 
Uh, Jake and David have slides. Mark is going to speak to us without slides. So I'm going to invite Mark to come forward first, kind of set the, the tone, and then we'll, we'll move on from there. So welcome, Mark. Thanks, Ben. Um, I've been asked to basically contextualize or situate Indigenous housing and Indigenous people here in Canada and its composition. There are approximately 2 million Indigenous people in Canada that represents roughly 5%. Um, it's comprised of First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis. Um, what's one of the most interesting features that not everybody appreciates is that over 85% of Indigenous people in this country do not live on reserves. They don't live in the north. They don't live on Métis settlements. They're in urban areas. And that has um, not only um, policy implications and program and service design, um, and the other unique feature that for Indigenous people is that we have an extremely young population. Almost 50% of Indigenous people in this country are under the age of 25, and almost 40% of that population are under the age of 15. So again, from a policy point of view, it has tremendous implications uh, about how we look at building community and certainly the situation of housing for Indigenous people wherever they are in this country uh, is a big challenge. The other interesting feature in our community is that we also have an emerging seniors population. And again, the impact on housing uh, is going to have a, a, a tremendous impact. Um, we're experiencing, obviously, longer longevity. Um, but unfortunately for our senior population, uh, they're usually the last ones hired and the first ones fired, and they're running out of money. So affordability is a much bigger driver uh, in the feature of accessing housing generally. But that's what uh, David and Jake and I are going to be talking about um, from an on-reserve consideration uh, in the north as well as from an, an urban context. So with that, uh, I'll let Jake take it away. Okay, great. I'm going to steal some water. So, uh, yeah, that's just forward slash and uh, pointers. <clears throat> great, thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, looks like a full house. Great. Uh, so when Ben asked me to come forward and you know speak a bit about housing, uh, I'll be honest, I, I stepped away from the housing sector for almost 10 years. I've uh, <clears throat> working with the Ontario Federation of Indian Friendship Centers. I, I became a policy analyst for housing <clears throat> across the province and worked with those, uh, those three specific groups for a number of years. And before that, I had worked with the Chiefs of Ontario and worked with that uh, OAP NTSC, a technical advisory unit looking at water and infrastructure across the, the province. <clears throat> so in many ways, I was able to be exposed to both on-reserve and off-reserve housing. And for a while, I stepped away from it and decided to go down the academic route, uh, get some practice. And it's, it's one of those things that I just keep getting called back to. And I'm not sure what to make sense of it, but I imagine um, it, there's something down the line for me to to tap into. So what I wanted to do tonight was just kind of give us an overview of housing um, from the perspective of housing, homelessness, infrastructure, water, etc. So I'm just going to raise a, a number of points uh, to consider, uh, to look at, but also at the same time try to contextualize this conversation that we're having across Canada and not only in terms of the profession, the practice, but also the institute and what is some of our responsibilities towards that. So I often start off with this slide lately. Um, I've been trying to address the elephant in the room. Um, I think for, me, for many, many reasons, uh, many events that we go to across the city, country, universities, et cetera, 
you know, we're, we're grappling with this notion about the land acknowledgement. And <clears throat> for me, when I, when I think about it, I uh, like to play on words. I think sometimes we can say more with two words than 200 words, you know, so in this case, when you think about it, um, the reason we are in, in terms of the land acknowledgement is because of the Indian Act, right? So when you think about it a bit more, uh, Canada's Indian Act continues to exercise extensive control over the lives of First Nations people, and to a large extent, the continued planning and design of infrastructure in First Nation communities. So when we speak about housing for Canada's Indigenous people, we must understand the historical context we are up against, and second, the political context that we are wrestling with right now. And so I always find this slide to be most impactful, you know, in terms of the situation that we're trying to address, um, the truth that we're all up against, the one that we're trying to acknowledge and reconcile at the same time. I think most of us who have, are familiar with Kent Monkman, uh, the work that he's produced over the last number of years, specifically this image, 2017, right, the historical context. Um, housing has become such a sexy, research project in the industry, in the practice, and the professions that we almost treat it as a novelty in many ways. So in many ways, I, I take offense to a lot of times we see these conversations about housing, um, and I think we're coming at it from the wrong spirit. So when you think about the, the image in front of us, um, <clears throat> the foreground pretty much tells it all. You know, why we're in a situation of First Nations housing and housing in the background, you know, the substandard construction that we're trying to deal with. Um, and just the whole situation about the Institute, the Royal Institute, the REIC, uh, the Royal, uh, our relationship with the Crown and the, as, um, as wards of the state, right? So you start to see a very um, interesting image in front of us that really paints a, a negative picture. So in many ways, you know, we can't escape the historical context of why we're talking about housing. It's not just about affordability, it's not just about the materials, but it's also you know, the family unit in many ways. I think sometimes when we talk about housing, we want to solve the physical artifact that's in the background. But for the most part, I think we're asking the wrong question. You know, and sometimes the question that we're asking is beyond the, our reach as designers. So in many ways, to me, it's about the family unit. How do we try to assist that? How do we try to um, create healthy communities? And obviously, that's going to start from the individual in the home and then branch out to leadership, et cetera, in terms of what we have. So I'm from Attawapiskat, um, <clears throat> Northern Ontario. Most of you know who, where Attawapiskat is or what Attawapiskat has become. Um, in, in the last decade, I would say, you know, Attawapiskat's become the poster child of a lot of issues across Canada. But like the image says, there are 630 First Nation communities across the country. And many of those communities share the same situations and challenges as Attawapiskat, right? So, when you think about it, there's 50 different nations, 50 different languages, and each one of these communities have distinct opportunities and challenges in front of them. Um, the reason I put the image on the left-hand side, I'm just gonna dive into that image a bit here, and on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. In terms of planning, uh, this is a perspective I've shared with others over the course of time. And I think about the severed relationship, you know, the, the state and the government has caused First Nations and how infrastructure is funded. When you look at that image on the left-hand side, and <clears throat> we're talking about this relationship with the church right now, and I think about planning in communities, you see the image of where the actual church is located, right here, you know, and how that's been situated in the planning of indigenous communities. If you have a chance to look at other First Nation communities across, across the country, in many ways you will see the church has severed the relationship with the river in terms of the planning. So in many ways, you'll notice that, and you'll notice where the water treatment plants are being situated in our communities. Those, in many ways, I find are, oh, geez, challenges, you know, in terms of consulting with the community, in terms of the social relationships that families have with the water. And so in many ways, when you look at a lot of First Nation communities, you see this situation, right? And then you see a trickle effect in terms of the materiality that actually composes our communities. When you think of the housing situation on the right-hand side, you start to look at our traditional forms, and you start to see a shift in the materialism. You know? So there's a huge shift in material culture, a huge shift in material values, um, but obviously it really comes down to this relationship that we have with the state you know, in many ways, that it's, it's torn, it's tattered, and in many ways it's pretty much unrecoverable. 
you know, in terms of how we're trying to move forward. So in many ways, Attawabasca has become the symbol of a, a nationwide problem. Uh, it just seems to be one in northern Ontario. Uh, I just happen to be from the community, you know, so in many ways it becomes a very challenging and sometimes emotional and sensitive uh, topic to speak to at the same time, right? So what I want to do, I just want to go through a number of slides, <laughs> set the context, you know, in terms of what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, I just put up there, here are a few things you need to know about the Indigenous housing issues. I don't expect to cover all of Canada in 20 minutes, nearly impossible, <laughs> so, but I'll just give you a brief overview in terms of what some of the numbers look like. So the population, as Mark said, you know, in 2016, it's pretty close to 1.17 million people, 42% of our, what do you call it, over the next decade. Uh, in 2016, as Mark said, 2 million, roughly about 1.67 right now. Uh, that was 2016, and the population is below the age of 25. So you, what you see on the right-hand side is a good composition of where most of our First Nations, um, the Métis, non-status Indians, and Inuit people are located from province to province just to give you an indication of what we're up against and where most of our community members are residing. Uh, so why do I foreground these numbers? Well, according to the st uh, Standing, uh, standing uh, Senate Committee of Aboriginal Peoples, the overall number of new unreserved housing needs right now ranges about 85,000. Uh, speaking to my colleague and mentor at AFN the other day, he's saying it's up in the 100,000 numbers, 100,000 <coughs> units short across the country. So when you think about that, um, this puts a lot of pressure, you know, on First Nations government system at the local level, but also it's a human capacity issue. You know, I think this is something Mark and I will talk about later on in terms of, you know, organizations having to be more than just housing service providers. We have to be a lot more than that. And obviously there's the whole notion of the aging, the housing stock that's out there right now. But the reason I brought up that earlier number, I was just considering putting this slide in here that I took it out. 1.67 million people in the last, let's say, 400 years. In the last four years, Canada has let in 1.68 million immigrants. And over the next four years, we're going to hit 200. So when you think about that, that's close to 2 million people that are going to be in, um, admitted into Canada. And so the attrition of First Nation population is just getting more and more saturated. So it's almost like we are at this level of exponential immigration, but at the same time, our increase in Aboriginal numbers are just going to be fairly minimal. So it's almost like we're, we're never going to catch up to that state. And so just looking at those numbers, I consider that in terms of the migration and, and this notion of a diaspora, you know, this notion that a lot of Indigenous people are migrating to urban centers. And so I've kind of labeled this as a domestic diaspora in terms of what's going on and trying to, uh, trying to realize that hopefully our experience as indigenous people doesn't get caught up in the larger international diaspora that's going on. So, right, so that is something to consider as you move forward that as we move in, 85% of our people are urbanized. <clears throat> At the same time, there's a lot of washing out that's occurring in the process. So just keep that in mind. Uh, in terms of overcrowded housing conditions, this is just an idea, again, just showing out some figures and numbers of what we're up against and trying to address issues of housing issues across, <coughs> across Canada. Um, more often than not, housing conditions lead to poor health and social issues in the community, right? So housing does uh, have a huge impact on the, the well-being of not only of our children, but also our young people and our elderly people. Um, obviously, you know, overcrowded housing conditions lead, lead to lower uh, achievement rates in school, then this leads to income disparity, then it leads to homelessness issues. So, right, so you start to see the ripple effect. Um, on the left-hand side, you see in terms of where a large majority of the populations are located. Obviously, our western provinces where we have a large <clears throat> number of First Nations people, uh, you start to see this notion, the, the percentage of units uh, in need of major repair, then we get the overcrowded condition at the same time, right? So it, it's, pretty, it's pretty telling in terms of what we're up against. I know a lot of times we just talk about it, but when you start to look at the numbers and where they're situated across the country, uh, it's pretty evident. You know, it, it's becoming a, a larger issue as we move forward. Substandard construction is a huge one. You know, <clears throat> in terms of, you know, we talk about mold. I think you see that in the CBC news all the time. Uh, most communities are are challenged with substandard construction materials. Uh, the, the construction methods within our community, some of them, most of them are not conducive to the environment that we're trying to design for. 
Uh, this also comes down to the skill set, the skill set that's within communities. Sometimes we think, you know, 16 inches on center is the way to go, but with the advancement of technology, we're starting to see, you know, more quality controlled environments to build houses, but at the same time is the training and the, the skill development there along with that technology. So that's something I always consider in terms of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> more often than not, when we do our studios or just telling, talking with students, we, I, I try to get them to think about this whole notion of materiality, you know, like a, a sheet of plywood, four by eight, you know, that might be a skateboard park for some of our more <clears throat> fortunate uh, youth in the, the southern parts of the province, but you, know, you look at a, a sheet of plywood up in the northern community, you know, um, having to deal with domestic violence, very different. So you start to see the values placed on material are very different. So in many ways, if we start to work with communities, I ask people to consider that, to consider not only the technologies and the skill set that actually goes into it, but also think about how that material has to be used um, and, and, and how it occurs over the course of time and the skill set that comes with it. Accessibility standards are obviously a huge issue too, right? Uh, many people in the north are challenged not only with income, but also in their terms of their diet. You know, diabetes is, um, <clears throat> is rampant in our community, so in many ways a lot of the communities don't have proper accessibility, you know, in terms of ramps to get into our community. So in many ways, you, you can see that this is more than just a, a, a simple conversation. There's a lot of issues that go into this entire issue about Indigenous housing. And obviously, you can't have housing without adequate water. You know, we, we can't escape it. Uh, housing and water go hand in hand. Um, you know, as of late, the Department of Indian Services says there's 97 boil water advisories as of, as of 2016. Uh, 59 remain in place in 41 communities. Uh, government officials say at least 22 boil uh, water advisories in First Nation remain in place after 2021. So, you know, it makes you wonder the, <clears throat> the commitments that the Prime Minister had towards trying to address these situations, right? So, again, just giving you an idea of, like, the number of active drinking uh, cases across the country right now. It's surprising to see that, you know, Ontario leads in many ways with, with almost 80. Um, so, uh, again, you just can't escape housing from water. Renewable resources, another one. Uh, this is something that really hits close to home. Uh, just being part of a northern environment, <clears throat> watching a lot of individuals rely on wood. You know, it, it just seems to have an impact, not just the dry heat that it has on the construction of materials, the drying and the thawing and the permafrost that comes with it, but also the whole notion of, you know, just the individual's health. I, I can say honestly with my own family, um, my mother's got a situation. She's relied on a type of wood stove for a number of years and it's, it's, it's quite hurtful to see somebody who's like cough is every, who's having a, a very rough cough in their throat over a number of decades, right? So, and that's only because of substandard construction materials and what's available and the cost of energy in the north is ridiculous, right? So that's cou couple that with um, the cost of food on top of that in the shorter construction season. So you start to see a snowball effect that is quite huge that it's, it's almost next to impossible to try to cover this conversation in 20 minutes. So not all is negative, I would say. Um, as a policy direct uh, um, analyst for a number of years, having the opportunity to travel Ontario and get as far as Red Lake, get up to Pickle Lake, get up to James Bay, um, Windsor, Sarnia, the far from the far corners of the province. It was um, it was nice to work with the First Nation community, but also the Métis uh, community and the Inuit community across the province. And so, in many ways, if we're trying to think about um, the whole notion of housing and home ownership on reserve and off reserve, it's not so cut and dry. It says right there are many tools out there. There are many policies. There are many communities coming together. But for the most part, when you look on the right hand side, you start to see that. You know, this whole notion of leadership, integrated services, wraparound services, investments, what's going on, what's pushing and pulling in terms of trying to develop a framework. So this became our framework, Ontario Urban Rural um, Housing Framework for First Nation Communities in Ontario. And it took a, I would say, two years to develop this framework of actually getting into our communities, uh, developing relationships, getting to each uh, organization to actually, you know, step into each other's door and try to find some sort of common ground. And at the end of the day, we realized that in order to have that framework, we had to look at leadership. We had to look at investments. We had to look at integrated services. We had to think about the policies that were in play, 
Uh, we also had to think about the equity and respect, but also the support of infrastructure that was going to actually inform the three uh, driving factors. And at the end of the day, we start to think about some of the imperatives. Uh, there's resource sharing, land and water, the use of traditional knowledge, uh, pride, identity, cultural safety, and more importantly, skill, capacity, and training. So in many ways, when you think of this, uh, this Venn diagram, <laughs> we are trying to achieve a holistic model that was encompassing of all the services that were being provided by many, many organizations who have to do more than just provide housing. They have to actually be counselors, they have to be investors, et cetera. So in many ways, it comes down to leadership, a lot of invested, investment and having a, a holistic wraparound services that actually addresses some of the issues of home ownership. Uh, another one, a possible opportunity, something that's been in place for a while is this notion of the First Nation Lands and Management Act. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, uh, it's an opportunity for First Nations to, to opt out of the Indian Act, uh, develop some sort of land management strategy that's actually going to be in their favor so they can have opportunities for land management authorities. As of the 2019, uh, we have 153 First Nations who have entered into the Land Management Act, and they are operating under their own land codes. So you start to see that there is flexibility. Um, again, not all First Nation communities are afforded with the same luxury. Uh, we have communities in the Okanagan who are very fortunate in terms of the industry that they're, they're exposed to. We have communities in the tar sands who are you know, really about uh, skill development, economic development, investment, natural resources. Uh, so the list goes on and on, right? So in many ways, it's not completely negative. There is a lot of leadership. There are tools coming down that have been developed over a number of years. So it's giving people and communities an opportunity to actually get around and work within the Indian Act. Uh, a couple more slides. <laughs> so I put this one up here because I think it's important. It's the indigenous cultural iceberg. Uh, um, <clears throat> some of you may have seen this before, but it's interesting when you look, you know, up here, the, the, the material culture that actually goes into housing and community development, a lot of this stuff is easily seen at the surface. These are the symbolic gestures, you know, the stuff that we actually talk about above the surface are those things that can be easily seen, uh, created by people, place, and policies external to the culture, including architecture and functional objects, right? And so below the surface, the underpinning of all these factors is something that I think is important that we try to push here at, at uh, Carleton uh, in the courses that we teach uh, by bringing forward some of the other aspects, the worldview, the history, the oral tradition, you know, the community networks, the stories, languages, traditional knowledge, government systems, land ethic, and other relations to nations. This is the stuff that is not necessarily seen. You know? So this is the stuff that we tend to skim over, um, <clears throat> kind of, you know, look for, uh, but not really know how to get there. You know, in so many ways, as part of our, our pedagogy is to really try to foreground this whole notion of what's seen, what's invisible, and what's present. And finally, the last slide, um, the political context, working towards an architecture of reconciliation. So at ASAU, we embrace the whole notion of call to action number 92, specifically three key actions. Uh, commit to building respectful relationships and obtaining free, prior, and informed consent with Indigenous peoples for proceeding with projects. I think we're doing that right now with our graduate studio, which is great. Uh, to ensure that Indigenous people have equitable access to jobs, training, education opportunities in the corporate sector, and that Indigenous communities gain long-term sustainable benefits from projects. And finally, to provide education on the history of Indigenous peoples that requires skill-based training in intercultural competency, human rights, and anti-racism. So in many ways, I've tried to paint a picture of the highs and lows of First Nations housing. And um, <clears throat> after this, we'll turn it over to David. But I just wanted to give you a sense of what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, just paint the backdrop and give us a foundation. Great. Thank you. Okay. Got it. I think I'm good. Is this the? Okay. 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 Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks, Jake, for that um, really great overview, and uh, thanks, Mark, for the introductions. Um, okay. Uh, I time myself on my my drive down here, and I'm a little bit longer than my 20 minutes, so I'm going to jump right in and talk as fast as I can. Uh, the title is, is part of a much longer lecture that I talk about home alienation and the politics of domesticity. 
Um, I guess I would just say, hopefully, the, the underlying, um, my feeling about housing is that um, we talk, I guess to Jake's point, we talk about the, the poor artifacts of housing uh, on reserves, but um, uh, there's also a much bigger social and political agenda involved in housing that a lot of people uh, un underestimate the power of it, um, in a sense. Uh, I want to just position myself very quickly um, to say I'm, I'm Métis. My dad is Métis. This is my dad's family. They're the Whitford family, if any of you are from Alberta, northern Alberta. Um, my dad was an educator and did a lot of his work on uh, basically looking at education sovereignty on, on First Nations reserves in Alberta primarily as a consultant. Um, and uh, my mom's not Indigenous, so she's a, a third generation uh, uh, Canadian settler um, in, from Austria originally. Um, but um, so th this is my uh, Whitford family giving me my voice, which I'm very, uh, I, I want to honor my family when I speak about things like this. But I also wanted to acknowledge that uh, as Mate my Metis family, um, I don't have any lived experience on reserves. Um, uh, my family have been living in cities and urban environments for at least three generations from, by my account. So um, very much urban indigenous peoples. Um, so when I talk about indigenous housing, I'm coming from a place as an architect um, and I've inherited my dad's, um, I guess, um, interest in pushing indigenous self-determination um, into this colonial agenda that Jake talked about. So I was raised in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, um, and uh, really coming from a northern community, uh, I think this is something that uh, Jake much more remote than, than Prince Albert. Um, but uh, when, when I headed into my career from, from leaving Prince Albert to Saskatoon and then Calgary to do my architecture degree, um, very much my career was uh, exploratory, as many architects uh, start off that way. This is how we learn about the world is through the buildings that we study. And um, my young professional career uh, sort of ended up spanning a very uh, big spectrum of what housing means. So the image on the left was the last project I worked on as an intern architect. It was about a 15 to $20 million single family home for four people um, in Saanich. Uh, and then when I started teaching, I was um, drawn into a project where we were uh, visiting Kenya every summer and working with locals there. Um, and visiting places like on the right, which is Kibera in Nairobi. And very much struck uh, through these years with questioning how this happens. How, as a people, as a species, we think that that's okay. And I think ever since then, I'm still trying to figure that out to this day, how we think this is okay. And when it comes to housing, I've done a, you know, a lot of writing and thinking about it. And when we talk about single-family housing, um, the biggest factor is uh, why, we, why that happens, I believe, is, is the commodification of the house. So the image on the left is uh, just a typical suburban house, as we're all familiar with, similar to the ones many of us, I'm sure, grew up in. Uh, the image on the right is the Sears Roebuck housing uh, from the early 20th century. And I won't go into this in detail, but if you look at that poster for the houses uh, in, the, in the early 20th century, there's a couple of key messages here. The first one is you don't build a house on your own without these plans. And the next one that's highlighted is don't pay an architect to design your houses. Those are key messages. One, you shouldn't build your own house and you shouldn't hire someone to design a house for you because we've figured it out. We know what you need. We're going to give it to you for a cheap price and we're going to deliver it for you just like something off the shelf at Costco. The problem with that is that every time you take a step away from the people that are living in a house, you're getting farther away from meaningful um, domestic space. So Christopher Alexander, an architect, uh, wrote about this many years ago now. Um, but he just talks about the problem of the pattern of control over housing is that, um, and I'm just jumping into this quote, that decisions are in the wrong hands being made at levels far removed from the immediate concrete places where they have impact. And there's a colossal mismatch between the organization and decision of control and the needs and appropriateness and good adaptation which the biological reality of the housing system actually requires. So to Jake's point about the Indian Act, when you're talking about indigenous housing on reserves, you have even a bigger gap of colossal mismatch between decision making and the people that it impacts. And the key thing here is this biological reality. So the analogy that I like to use for this, uh, a number of years ago when my daughters were really little, they really wanted Venus flytraps, so they didn't have them in Sudbury. 
Um, so I had to buy them from the West Coast and they shipped them out there. And I got them, I was very excited, so I planted them immediately in these little pots and like within three days they were dying miserably. Um, and my wife finally took notice, she said, what are you doing? You're putting those in like the wrong soil. So she helped me figure out they needed to be in a sandier soil and we replanted them and they came back to life. Well, the issue with most of the early housing and up to today exactly is that the building on the left has its own lifelines. It's, a, it, it's part of, if you think of houses as living organisms, they have lifelines. Um, so what do you need for that house? Well, the first thing you needed for that typology to emerge was a road system that allowed you to get from your work and back to your home. You needed clean water, you needed a sewer system. In order for that house to thrive, you also need a home hardware. You need somebody to call if your furnace goes out. Um, you know, eventually you need a lawnmower, you need all those other things that you buy to put into that house. The image on the right basically took that house, ripped it from its lifelines and transplanted it into environments that had none of that. More, most importantly for many Canadians or North Americans, what made that house on the left attainable was a mortgage system, so the financing of it. And then the financial mobility of selling your house and moving up the ladder. You know, all of our parents and grandparents went through that process if, you, if, if they were, uh, you know, privileged enough in Canada um, to gain wealth off of that house, which is again not, not a possibility on the house of the right. So they were, they were doomed to fail from the get-go. Jake mentioned um, the rights. So if you look at the United Nations Declarations of the Rights of Indigenous People, it talks about Indigenous people having the very right, the human right, to protect their cultures, their designs, their technologies. So it doesn't say housing in there, it doesn't mention architecture in there, but if you read between the lines, there is an inherent right of Indigenous people to not have these alienated houses in their territories. Um, and Article 23 talks about Indigenous people having the right to be actively involved, and this is one that I've written a little bit about, questioning what does that mean to Indigenous people and things like urban Indigenous um, housing. Um, Mark would know more about that because he is someone actively involved. Um, and how do you administer these kinds of programs through your own institutions? So as a designer, one of the things to point out is that uh, we have 0.02% of a percent of architects in Canada who are Indigenous, who are, who are designing these houses um, from an Indigenous perspective. So I'm going to run through just some of my own personal experiences working on reserves over the years, and um, it's kind of the, the, the tip of the iceberg that Jake talked about in many ways, but I think actually these projects hopefully share with you how you transcend the tip of the iceberg and dig into the, into the lower stuff. This was uh, for a number of years we worked, I was teaching at Montana State in Bozeman, and uh, worked with Red Feather Development in Lame Deer. These are the Northern Cheyenne people, and this was a nonprofit group that were building straw bale homes on reserves. So they subsidized the homes. Uh, I think these houses cost about sixty or seventy thousand dollars for the family. Um, and then Red Feather would bring together a group of uh, volunteers. We'd bring some architecture students as well. Um, and then you basically would camp out on site for the summer. Um, not the whole summer. We were there for maybe three weeks or something, living out of your tent. Um, and the image on the left, I, I pulled out my camera that day quickly because it captures the spirit of what this was like. So the, the, there's a couple of guys in this image that were recently out of jail um, and being reintegrated back into their community. Um, there were high school students there, there were community students studying architectural technology, uh, and the family was there every day on site. Um, and in the evenings, we'd have campfires, they gave us cultural teachings. I shared my first um, sweat lodge ceremony with their community during that time. So this was home as a, commodity, a community, right? And at the end of the day, this is a pretty standard looking house. They perform very well thermally. Um, but the entire summer was a community building process. Um, so it transcends that idea of an object or a commodity. This house is, and I've heard a lot of great reports about these houses. There's very little vandalism of the red feather houses um, because almost everybody, many people in the community remember having somehow touched that building at some point, the community as well. When I came back to Canada to teach, um, I, I received a, re a research grant, and I won't go into the Métis research in, in much detail, but one of my interest areas at the time was saying I, I was always clearly knew I was Métis and I was always an architect, but I didn't know what a Métis architect was. So I did a research grant and put the question mark in there and ended up visiting uh, across the prairies, um, all three prairie provinces, um, you know, getting to know a lot about my own uh, ancestors and relatives and housing on that and, and asking questions and uh, writing about this. 
Um, and the, the, what I wanted to highlight, there were many lessons learned on there, but in this research project related to the house specifically, we were looking into this idea of the one-room house um, and talking to various elders and people about that, and this is the INAC, formerly uh, ISC, uh, um, about the, the INAC homes. And in our research, we were, we were thinking about the idea of intergenerational living in domestic space. So as you probably know, right, in traditionally in teepees and igloos, and even the one bedroom or the one room Métis homes, families all live together. Grandparents sometimes, parents, kids, everybody had sleeping arrangements. And it seemed so subtle but so profound to me that we, they were talking about how in that space, uh, say for instance somebody brought home a new date and they wanted privacy, they were courting somebody, um, the family would make social arrangements. So they talked about how people would position themselves in the room differently, they would create noise they would start action activities in the room to create more noise to drown it out. So within that one room, somebody would feel a sense of privacy. This was a series of social relations. There was also in a conversation with Maria Campbell, you may know the Métis author of Halfbreed. She talked about uh, in her one room home how the grandmother slept at the front door um, and they always protected the women and children. So sometimes she said the men would come home after a few drinks. Grandmothers would be the bar, the, the kind of uh, the barrier and tell you guys are out in the shed tonight, you're not coming in here. So then we have the introductions of this. And Maria talked about kind of, uh, the more she started talking about it, a lot of bad things start happening in communities when people come home and close doors and lock doors. So the issue of privacy, actually dividing up the, the nuclear family into individual rooms from the age of zero onwards is very much a political act that we don't uh, give enough credit to. Uh, okay, so I'm going to fly through these relatively quickly. Uh, Jake mentioned, uh, um, or in, in the introduction, it was mentioned, I worked uh, for a few years um, as a consultant with the um, National Research Council, and they were putting together this booklet. Um, many remote northern indigenous communities were looking for a resource, basically. Their housing managers were saying, we don't have a good resource to, like, how do I determine the wall type? You know, how much insulation do I need? But I just want a like solid resource for that. So the NRC has been working on this with Morris and Hirschfeld, and um, they're on their way. But they approached me initially and said, would you design four model homes to be put into this booklet for remote northern indigenous communities? And I said, nope, I, w I won't do that. That's really not at all what I'm interested in. But um, I wrote this position paper, which is still sitting on my desk someday, should probably um, publish it in some form, but um, I wrote them a position paper called The Path to Healthy Housing, which was about community-led design processes. Um, basically said, I'm not, I can't do that from where I am. Um, and they came back and they tripled their budget uh, for this and um, they let me implement this. And it turned out to be, I think, a very su a strong success. And that's what this diagram was, a part of that publication was to say, the lifelines of that suburban house on the left that I showed earlier are irrelevant if you don't tap into the lifelines of the community's specificities, it will die. So in all the, way, it, the only way you can kind of figure this diagram out is by being in the community and letting the community lead all of this. So I established uh, uh, an advisory board uh, with those funds. Jake was on that board, as you can see, and uh, we set out to try to figure out how to do this. And, uh, we sent out requests of, of interest and established these four communities that we worked with. Um, and the other thing that I'd said is that I, I, I'm happy to coordinate this and outline how we can engage with communities, but I think it'd be better to have First Nations architects um, move, working with these communities. So a lady of Smoke, of Smoke Architecture, worked with Bunabonavi Cree Nation. And I'll just pause for a second on that because um, in my opinion, even though this is a housing initiative, uh, if you're a, a girl in northern Manitoba, um, and you know an uh, architect is flying in to talk about housing. Uh, in my opinion, it has far more impact if it's a lady that walks off the plane as the lead architect. Imagine how many girls that impacts uh, over the, the times that she goes and visits that community. Brian Porter of Turo worked with Fort Severn. Um, and these are kinds of things we worked with the architects in advance. I coordinated all of this, but they worked with youth groups, we worked with women groups. Um, and let people hear what they wanted, wanted to do for their housing. Uh, it also involved part of the program that I'd outlined was that uh, spend time there. So each architect spent three days in community um, and went on on the land and uh, got in touch with the people. They could talk about their patterns of living and what they were uh, doing for harvesting food. Alfred Waugh, who is your next speaker, was part of this project as well, working with the Delaunay. 
So, um, and that's Alfred's project that he produced for this project. So those are the four projects that came out of that um, initiative, which again, I didn't design anything. Um, and it just reaffirmed to me they're very, very different. They're different sizes, they have different construction types, um, depending on the First Nation. Um, and, and that was the whole point, that um, First Nations need housings that serve their needs. They can't be kind of uh, co uh, cookie-cuttered. Uh, okay, so Indigenous Homes Innovation Initiative. I don't know if you guys remember this, but if, when this first came out, it's the image on the left, where it said the feds to test the limits of Indigenous housing ideas through a new contest. Uh, somehow IS got this great idea that they would take 30-some million dollars and make it a competition for First Nations to compete for. Well, I think at the time I remember doing the math and Canada was maybe $85 billion short to address the housing needs that Jake talked about, if not more. So imagine immediately we had chiefs um, uh, phoning up coming to the school at, at McEwen, uh, really irate about this. You know, you, you have an $85 billion dollar problem and you throw 30 million of that at First Nations and then tell them to compete for it. It didn't land well at all. In fact, a lot of First Nations were going to um, uh, walk away and, and, and they, they got the message very quickly. That messaging got pulled very quickly. Our government's very good at, at readjusting the messages and, and the media. Uh, uh, you could see the concerns uh, mounted. Um, and then they rebranded it uh, in a very good way. Um, and so this was uh, the, the Indigenous Steering Committee that was established, and they rebranded it as a seed fund application process, which actually um, turned out to be really well. They brought housing managers from across the country together with Indigenous architects. Um, we worked with Mass Design Group out of the United States, um, many of you will know. Um, and Mass put together this. This is free um, online if you're interested. Um, and, you know, it's got its holes, but overall it, it turned to, out to be a really good tool. So out of uh, IHI, we worked with a few communities. I'm going to not go into this in too much detail. Whitefish Lake, First Nation, we worked with. Uh, and actually, they're just starting construction on these. Well, they're going to be done in a few months. Uh, they had already had this suburban um, layout, so that was already kind of hard for us to work with. We worked with Mass Design, who did the, um, the landscaping plan on this. And I won't go into any detail on these, other than to say these are um, SIP panel homes. Uh, anybody who works with First Nations understand the budget constraints are almost like impossible. So we designed two units, uh, two or two-story salt box, and then this little shed roof, um, and uh, that's sort of the section of it. Um, I won't go into these in any detail. This one is, like I said, this is actually built. They're just putting the siding on right now. However, the community may be changing siding colors on us, which has me a little nervous, but. Um, that's actually a really important thing that I learned from Brian Porter. You know, when you, as the architect, uh, we're used to picking colors, but if you really want to walk the walk, if communities want different colors, then that's their housing project, right? Um, this one I think is interesting to, to, to explain a little bit more. This is the Opasquia Cree Nation, and this one um, we came on to later, late in the game in this project in many ways. Um, this is in northern Manitoba. And they've been working with um, a group of people. So uh, Jacob Manns from the Decentralized Design Lab, he's a professor in the United States. Um, and this is the One House Many Nations, which is part of um, uh, Idle No More movement. Uh, and they had designed this, this house, which got built here in Toronto for an expo or something, and then got shipped back to OCN. And it's kind of not aged very well and wasn't very well received by the community in, in some cases. But, it's testing this idea that um, one of the biggest problems on reserve homes is the mechanical systems. So the mold that Jake mentioned and all that, um, when mechanical systems fail, there's not an easy way to get into homes and find, test the equipment, uh, then replace it if needed, um, especially in remote communities. There's not really a great maintenance system for mechanical systems. So what they designed was this idea of what they call a universal utility core puts all your mechanical equipment into one room as a kind of lean-to onto the house, which allows uh, an external person, say a tribal council uh, person, to come around and service all the equipment, make sure everything's functioning perfectly, no disruptions to the people. Um, you can do it on a regularized schedule. So Decentralized Design Lab had done a bunch of studies of this on, you know, how, what are the dimensions? Should it go inside the house, outside, long, wide? Um, and we kind of came onto this project through IHI and started to I think we simplified it in many ways. That was working with builders and just saying, okay, look, actually, how does this work? 
Um, and, and it ends up being just a, a, a lean-to. We had tried all these different um, scenarios with this thing. Um, and we stayed, kept it very simple. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. So there it is in the back of the house. This is just a one bedroom. It's not a tiny home. I think it's a very, very small home. <laughs> I don't know what the proper terminology is for tiny homes, but it's getting there. Um, but there you get a sense of what the utility core is and how it functions in the building. So there is ducting that runs into the house, but um, all of the, the kind of uh, mechanical units are on this, on this side with an external access. And this, like I said, is getting built. There's, we're actually building two of these right now. It's just starting in a, uh, in about a week or two. Um, they're getting pre, some of them, it's getting prefabricated in Saskatoon by a builder and then sent out there. And the community is going to be learning um, and documenting all of this. We're building one of them with passive house standard details and the other one is going to be built with standard details. Um, and part of the goal here is to do an actual couple of year analysis comparative to see what the capital uh, returns are on the investment for passive hosts. Because right now in communities, they don't get enough money to build passive hosts. I mean, they're having to build such cheap homes and they, they can't justify. So we want to use these two test houses that will look the exact same um, to show the government, hopefully, that uh, the investment will pay off in the long term. That's the inside of that. These are also designed to be expanded into two and three bedrooms eventually. And a big part of this that I want to mention is that, you know, the core is one component of it, but, you know, 50% of this project was looking at the idea of the nation themselves producing these cores. So we did a lot of precedent research into what those facilities would look like um, across the country. We, put, we worked with a systems engineer to figure out what kind of factory could work at OCN. So you're creating jobs, you're building capacity, um, and then they can start to outsource their expertise to other communities in this. So... Um, everything down to the equipment we would need. We priced all of this out uh, with the systems engineer um, and even did a draft layout of what that factory would look like. So when it came to uh, the Architects Against Housing Alienation, um, this is a group of six curators listed in the bottom of the left image. Um, somehow it slipped up there, but... Um, just looking who's missing, because I feel... Oh, it might be just myself and Adrian Blackwell missing on the names there. Uh, so we're a group of six curators um, from Waterloo and UBC particularly, and the thrust of this is to question the commodification of housing in Canada. So I don't know if any of you have heard about this, but we've established 10 teams across the country, each one focusing on a different aspect of uh, decommodified ideas for Canada and visions for how to do this. Um, and basically the pavilion in Italy is going to be converted into what we're calling a campaign headquarters for a housing movement. So we see it less as an exhibit of fancy stuff and more as a movement. Um, and uh, it's been a really interesting project working with um, each one of the 10 teams is composed of an architect, an advocate, and an activist. So we actually have 30 collaborators. Um, it's, it just continues to grow every day, I think. Um, but the point here is we're actually making demands um, that we intend to fulfill. Now, the, there are three Indigenous teams. One is Vancouver, Patrick Stewart's leading that team, and their demand is land back. So um, I, we, we hope we make some strides. I don't think we'll get all land back. Um, but uh, the Northern team for Yellowknife is also led by Indigenous women. They're specifically looking at violence against Indigenous women and housing solutions for, for Indigenous women um, and on the land teachings. And then my team um, is working on, on reserve housing. So. On our team is the One House Many Nations group, so that's um, Alex Wilson and Sylvia McAdam. And then we're working with the University of Manitoba Faculty of Architecture, so Sean Bailey's a fellow a Métis architect and teacher there, and Lancelot Core. Uh, and this has just been a really great project to collaborate on, um, and we're really excited about it. And I won't go into much detail on that, but I wanted to share that Dr. Alex Wilson, she's a professor at the University of Saskatchewan and one of the leaders of the One House Many Nations project, um, what blew me away, I asked her to come give a lecture to my students, and um, it was on housing, and so she said, yeah, I'll come talk about housing, and she started her lecture, and this is another version of that lecture, I found it online after, but she starts her conversations about housing with the constellations. Um, I've never heard anybody start a conversation about housing in the constellations, and then she talks about the cosmology of the Cree people, uh, and how the housing and the materiality, and then she talks about the forest, and she talks about all these, uh, these logs were stacked along the highway 
uh, from non-indigenous people logging on their, their traditional territories um, and knowing that they have a, housing, a massive housing shortage in their community. Um, and all of these kind of means of, again, alienating uh, indigenous people from their traditional practices and their landscape. So she's really introduced this idea to me of housing as cosmology. And how many housing providers uh, do we think uh, talk about it like that? So our demand as a group is this idea that we've developed um, of we're demanding home building design lodges on reserves. So I'll just read it. The, this is kind of the thesis statement right now. Federal funding for housing on reserves typically goes directly to the construction of housing as products to meet the urgent demands of existing shortages and deplorable housing conditions. We believe that investing in home building design lodges tied to housing manufacturing facilities on reserves can instead build capacity within communities by grounding the production of houses and their components in community values, language, and education. The way that it looks, just to clarify that a little bit, this isn't the case all over the place. And some First Nations are doing better, I think, with their communities building. But often what happens is they go to the local lumber yards. So for many along the North Shore in Ontario, for instance, they go to Home Hardware because Home Hardware will give them free design plans as long as they buy their materials from them. So this really is a commercialized product. Um, if you think of the, prof, uh, the money that comes from the government for, for housing, where does it go? It doesn't go to the community. It actually goes to the builders from outside of the community. So this is, a bit, in a sense, what we're proposing is um, starting a, a capacity building um, uh, place within communities. Um, and this will be part of the exhibit. We're actually designing this as an artifact um, that tells the story of OCN and what a design lodge is. Um, we, like Jake said, we actually really resisted as a team the idea of designing any houses for this. We're like, the last thing reserves need is more architects trying to vision what housing should look like on reserves. Like, nobody needs that anymore. There's so many good versions of that. Um, the problem is more systemic. So um, this exhibit is going to try to um, share um, you know, this, this is a, it'll be a fabric piece, um, which will be hand beaded. Um, and this is a, this is going to be an iPad with Alex telling the story that she tells about the constellation, um, which is, in, uh, is the, uh, what we call the Big Dipper. They have a story related to that and, and their people. So, um, it'll be very different in terms of what's in this exhibit, um, that this is a, a well-crafted well and well-cared-for object, which is what we think the house should be. So in a sense, this artifact is symbolic of the way we think of a house, that it can't be you know, repeated or cookie-cutted along the landscape. So I will end with that. Thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder of everybody where we are, we are now going to go to our third speaker, uh, Mark Markle, who will talk uh, about uh, housing issues uh, in, uh, in uh, Canada's larger cities where approximately 85% 80 of the Indigenous population resides. Mark, I guess um, maybe I can just go back to the... Uh... David, do you mind if we leave the image up there? Okay. <laughs> Mark, welcome. So from an urban perspective, as mentioned before, the overwhelming majority of Indigenous people in Canada reside in urban areas. And the one thing to remember is that the urban Indigenous population is also becoming increasingly generational. And the city is all that they know. They don't necessarily have a connection with the reserve community, with an Inuit community, with a Métis settlement or Métis community. If you ask somebody that's Indigenous in Ottawa where's home, they'll say Ottawa's home. And a lot of those connections that we have with a home community, the longer you're in an urban environment, the more you become disconnected with those home communities. So it presents a real challenge for communities in urban areas to create that sense of community uh, and connection with cultures. And the other challenge from an urban perspective is that we're not homogenous. We have the full range of diversity of Indigenous people from across the country, uh, and everybody has a different perspective, 
um, a different experience with, for lack of a better phrase, being colonized. And they don't have the same um, understanding of their culture. But I would say that for a majority of urban Indigenous people, there's a burning desire to learn and to understand who they are and how they're connected, not only inside of themselves as Indigenous people, but also their connection with their communities and establishing what a family might look like in an urban context. The other typical um, characteristic is that every urban community is different. It's different in terms of size, of composition, of circumstance in terms of their life situation. And housing has always been a challenge in urban areas. Um, it's been driven, you know, more, I think, from access to safe housing, let alone affordable. Um, and it's also typically been touched more by racism and discrimination than I think a lot of people want to admit. But that's the reality um, that urban Indigenous people experience. Um, and it can be overt. I, I find uh, racism and discrimination out west more overt, whereas in the east, because I think we've been exposed to non-Indigenous people for such a long time, it's much more subtle. Um, and understated, and it's, it, it can be difficult. The other typical experience in urban environments is the amount of lateral violence uh, and racism and discrimination that we impose on each other. And a lot of it revolves around how indigenous are you? If you're a status Indian versus a half breed, or a Métis or Inuit. And quite frankly, there's a lot of conflict that exists within the community. Um, and a lot of it can be exacerbated uh, when we look for housing. The other big feature of the urban environment is that homelessness is far more predominant. Uh, and it is very much an urban phenomenon. In big cities, 30 percent, 30 plus percent of homelessness is Indigenous. So here in Ottawa, we might make up 3, 4 percent of the population, but over 30 percent of the people on the street are Indigenous. And that's typical in Vancouver, in Calgary, in Winnipeg, in Montreal, in Halifax. It's consistent right across the country in large metropolitan areas. If you go out west, you go further up north, homelessness is even more predominant. And typically it could be 75, 85, 95% of the homeless population is Indigenous. Urban Indigenous housing providers basically started in the early 70s. And ironically, there's over 110 urban Indigenous housing providers. So the organization that I work for, which is Gignal Housing here in the city, we've been around since 1986. We have 210 units that's located in 75 buildings. So we're like MasterCard, we're everywhere, we're spread out across the city. We have a very small staff, we have nine, nine staff members, we've got a seven member Indigenous Board of Directors, and we have an asset base that we own that's in excess of $100 million. So if you extrapolate that and you look at 110 examples of what Gignal is across the country, there's an incredible amount of capacity, whether it's skills and knowledge, expertise, experience, specific experience in governance uh, that's evolved in a very unique way from an Indigenous perspective, and a collective asset base that, boy oh boy, what we could do if we were able to think and act together uh, and more collectively. And I think ultimately in terms of how important relationship building is, 
at the community level, we've got to do, it's one thing to negotiate with the federal government or the provincial government more now, but for an urban community, the relationship with municipal government is becoming far more important. And it's being recognized by municipal governments across the country. Um, we actually have a very good working relationship with the city of Ottawa that's evolved certainly over the past 20 years and it's deepened uh, and it goes up and down. I would say it went down during the pandemic because the city kind of went back to their default position and included the people that they're most comfortable negotiating with in putting and responding to community need. So they went to the United Way, they went to Ottawa Public Health, but the relationships they built up with the Indigenous community and our organizations that do service, including housing, was kind of left off the map. And we had to remind them, and it took them about a year, six months to a year to recognize that they needed to include us, but we had to speak up and we had to get in their face uh, and be insistent on being included in a lot of the interventions that were being provided by all levels of government, whether it was federal, provincial, or municipal. Um, I think the other part of where we're evolving to is also a better uh, understanding and relationship building exercise with local indigenous governments um, that historically we've been competing for a small amount of resources, whatever that is, including housing, and it's very territorial, and there isn't a level of cooperation that needs to be in place. As a housing provider, Gignal probably has 20% of our units that are for Algonquin, that we have Algonquin tenants from the two local reserve communities in quote, north of us in Kitagon Zibi, in Quebec and Pequawkanagon that's further west. But it would be nice to get to a point where we are talking with those local First Nations to think about better servicing Algonquin constituents in Ottawa to make their experience more healthy and to provide better choice for them that if they choose to move back to their communities, they're coming back as whole citizens with skill sets and something to contribute or they can make the choice to stay in the community here and help us build something bigger and better. But it's definitely um, something that a lot of people don't appreciate that there is an incredible amount of capacity and experience that already exists in the urban indigenous housing community. And we've got to work at that a lot more, with a lot more purpose. As I said, homelessness is still the major urban challenge. And what's also becoming a bigger driver in terms of housing, it's not just supply. The bigger issue is affordability, and that's been exacerbated by the pandemic. And when we look at Ottawa specifically, we've got over 40,000 Indigenous people in the National Capital Region. And in Ottawa, again, we have more than just Gignal in terms of housing capacity. We have 210 units. Uh, Inuit Housing provides over 60 units. Uh, Tawagan Transitional Housing for Young Women uh, have a home that provides transitional housing for women. Um, Tungasuvia Inuit and Wabano Center for Aboriginal Health provide housing outreach uh, and home, homeless outreach, pardon me, and housing assistance. And Minwash and Lodge have a women's shelter. So there is capacity in the community. Um, we do not currently have any shelter for Indigenous men, uh, and that's a, that's a huge challenge, and it's a problem. As I said, we've got a young population 
uh, that has all the challenges, whether it's on reserve or off reserve. Um, we also have an emerging seniors population where life expectancy is increasing. Um, but again, the driver, not you would think that it would be health related, uh, but it's actually affordability. The other unique feature of Ottawa specifically is that we've got an increasing Inuit population that over the last 10 or 15 years is probably more than doubled. And the other unique challenge that the Inuit community faces is that they're in crisis. Um, not only do they face an awful lot of violence within their own community, there is a level of vulnerability that um, seems to bring out predatory behavior around them and there are people that try to exploit them. And we see it simply in being a housing provider and it could be as quick as a weekend when somebody goes to a bar, invites people back to their unit and the next thing they know, Monday morning they don't have control over their unit. So it presents a different set of challenges for the community and for organizations and for the city uh, to better address um, some of the challenges that our Inuit community members are facing. And as I said, the pandemic has certainly exacerbated um, the situation and the vulnerability of housing, the security of housing. And an emerging issue that we certainly know in the mainstream population, but I think it's even more critical in, in the Indigenous community is mental health. Um, and it was interesting that Jake used the analogy of the iceberg. Uh, mental health is largely unseen and people suffer in silence and it's no different in the Indigenous community except that I think that it's far more pervasive um, and ultimately debilitating that we don't have a, a true appreciation. And that affects people's ability for housing. And I don't want to end on doom and gloom because I do think uh, there's been a lot of positive things that have happened in the urban Indigenous community and certainly around housing. Uh, and it's largely been because Indigenous people themselves have made a decision that they're going to tackle these issues and challenges uh, as Indigenous people and as community. Um, the reason why Gignal exists is because people in the mid-80s recognized that the mainstream housing providers, the City of Ottawa, the institutions, weren't able to properly or adequately respond to community need. So they established Gignal, it was an Indigenous group of people, and it's no different. It's been duplicated or we're part of the duplication at least 110 times across this country. And we can demonstrate that we can do for ourselves, that we have capacity, that we have knowledge, um, that we're listening to our community and trying to find solutions that meet the needs of our community. So I think I'll leave it there and turn it back to Ben. I, I neglected to mention that Mark has been very active in the school uh, over the course of the last term, um, working with the fourth year housing studio, which has been fantastic. Um, and Mark speaks very eloquently about opportunities really stemming from interaction uh, between native and non-native or indigenous and non-indigenous. And so this has been really, really good. I think when I think about what we've accomplished tonight, and I'm looking at the time, um, uh, big discussion is not, not clear we're going to accomplish that, but we'll have a little time for discussion. I do think what we've done is we've actually laid, laid the groundwork for an ongoing conversation, and I think I've certainly come away from this evening with a much better understanding of how, how, how broad and diverse uh, the issues are and how much opportunity there is for all of us to, to wade in and to, uh, to get involved uh, uh, in many different places and on many different levels. So thank you all very much, uh, David, Jake, Mark, fantastic. Can I invite the three of you just to come up? We have uh, five minutes for questions. I've got some pre-prepared ones, but we also have a uh, mic that uh, we can pass around. And uh, just in, um, you know, in, in uh, 
support of the idea that this is a discussion, I think I, I would like to defer to those of you in the audience. If you want to ask a few questions or things have come to your mind, uh, let's let's do it that way. So I've got uh, I get a mic box here with a um, a couple of mics in it. So I'm going to try to do this. Uh, does anyone have a How to turn this on. I just like to find out, the, I'm of the Western culture, I'm Irish, Canadian, and I, I don't even, any of that even in. But what I've seen is I've seen from Cardinal, Douglas Cardinal, and his beautiful architecture, like the, I call it the Museum of Civilization, which he called it at the beginning. The fact that he himself also put on Montreal Road an indigenous design building with curves as well. The TP, uh, all these different things, like I find compared to the pseudo Western style of architecture, which was what you were showing with the old box with the triangle roof, the curves and moving with nature, ideology that I, are, like what I'm trying to understand, they curve with nature better and the environment in, as I understand, from my studies. So what about you people in getting together with more curbs and designs? Thanks, Tom. I think Tom wants to take, take it into a formal discussion about uh, the form. Uh, yeah, Jake, give it to the, David on that. Do you want to talk about circles, Jake? <laughs> <laughs> Jake and I have an ongoing debate about the circle. Um, well, I think... Uh, Yes, it, it is true, and, and many indigenous um, cultures do have more circular and curving forms, and that is a part of um, the, the conversation amongst many indigenous architects, for sure. Um, I would say, I just wanted to let, to let you know, though, you know, Douglas Cardinal was also deeply influenced by uh, some European architects as well. So the, the architects of the, uh, the Baroque period, people like Borromini's churches, the geometry, and some of the natural work that was done in those curving forms deeply inspired him. So he... In many ways, I, I think, and I can't speak for him, but he sees the alignment um, in the reverence for nature uh, and form as a way to do that in a way. If you look at people like Gaudi in Spain and other places, very influential for him to come through it for his version of what a contemporary indigenous architecture should be. So I, I, I think many indigenous architects re and people resonate with that. We hear it everywhere. Um, we just heard it in our studio recently that uh, many indigenous people prefer curves. Um, so it's kind of built into the, the psychology, and many people do attribute it to nature, yeah. Yeah, that's sort of an antithesis to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's Serana Zabian. Uh, I should start with a short reflection. I studied architecture in the Lebanese University, and in our courses, studying vernacular local architecture wasn't optional. So I was curious to know if it is the case here in Canada, and do they actually like study or design any in indigenous architecture? And this will lead to another question. So if the indigenous architecture <clears throat> have its own language, and as mentioned, there is very, very few indigenous architects actively involved in design, but at the same time, we want them to be like as communities to lead. So I understand it's, it might be like a big problematic but how can we as international architects, designers, students actually make an impact? Um, do you suggest any starting point? And do you believe that adding this subject to university courses can do it? If not, do you suggest other strategies? Thank you. Um, it's working? Great. Uh, <clears throat> just to pick up on a bit of what David's comment was about, David and I have this interesting conversation about circles, and maybe it'll tie it into your second half of your, your question. Um, my observation is, you know, as a non-Indigenous person working with communities, the immediate reaction is to draw a round room. And this is the joke that David and I always have. It's that lack of knowledge and education of working with the communities, of trying to understand what is the spirit or the embodiment of those places, whether it's Northern Ontario, whether it's BC, there is a deeper sensibility to these places. As a non-Indigenous person, I 
<laughs> I get offended when I see these projects take off. In studios, let's begin with a circle. Why is that? That's a knee-jerk reaction because lack of education. You know, so in many ways, I, I purposely try to unpack that you know, and try to correct the status quo in terms of that. So if I was coming from a Cree perspective, I would use my language. I would look at the landscape. I would look at the, the notion of how I work with materiality and try to get a deeper sensibility of place before I draw a circle. So in many ways, I think you have to look into specific cultures around North America and how they embody certain materiality and how these spaces are shaped based on a more intimate understanding of place. Um, in many ways, I see a lot of indigenous, non-indigenous planners and architects just looking at the surface of our knowledge systems without really trying to get a sense of what is the story of this place, right? They're really just pecking at the soil beneath their feet, trying to grab at something that is innately not theirs. So in many ways, you know, this becomes a very contentious conversation and it's a challenge to throw it back across the table and educate us because I think we are trying to correct that status quo right now. I think we are making efforts in schools of architecture. I just wanted to add, based on um, uh, the previous comment um, from that gentleman, um, so Douglas Cardinal came uh, and taught uh, online studio for the first time in like 40 years or something um, at the McEwen School of Architecture a few years ago. And um, so we had him do the graduate design studio, indigenous design studio. And I, t I, I checked in a few times with him because uh, I know Douglas really very, very fairly well. And, um, and then I showed up for the final reviews. and. Um, what Douglas taught his students about indigenous design, he said, first and foremost, and these are key to him, he said, your project has to love and honor Mother Earth. That's your first thing you must do. And then the second thing in that studio is he said, uh, you have to design something that honors your grandparents and your ancestors. And those were the terms. So I showed up for the final reviews of this indigenous design studio, and there was an Italian villa on the lake. There was... <laughs> Uh, one young lady had done uh, a farmhouse in Russia for her grandparents. Um, and, you know, I, I never really talked to Douglas much after that, but I felt like Douglas was sort of doing what Jake's saying, is he's trying to say indigenous design isn't about the form and what it looks like, actually. The value system, it's not about that. Um, and, you know, what I think it was about, that girl from Russia, um, at the end of the day, she uh, broke into tears uh, with Douglas, and she said, you know, I've been studying architecture for five years, and nobody's asked me in the entire five years where I'm from, or, or even made that meaningful. Like, that wasn't a topic until Douglas Cardinal said, tell me about your grandparents. What did, what did they teach you? What, what are their value systems? And that conversation, and, and uh, it moved everybody. Um, so I think, to Jake's point about the... the iceberg, it's a much bigger conversation about your positionality as a person, a non-Indigenous person in Canada, and how you relate to people, and, and how you listen to communities and, and engage with them is really the key teachings. So I, I think we have time for one more question. Did I see a hand up? Okay. Well, a second. Um, I think it's uh, Jay. You've uh, alluded to um, the local diaspora and um, that 80 percent of indigenous people reside um, outside um, their local communities. Now my question is, um, well the term in economics is referred normally to as um, human capital flight. What is the actual economic impact, um, is there a dollar figure that can be quantified? Thank you. In terms of economic impact in virtually anything related to indigenous people, whether it's positive or negative, I think the notion is that we've been suppressed for so long and so completely being able to express who we are, being able to express what we want to do, whether it's education or employment, are gonna be the drivers going forward. So it's exponential in terms of turning the economic circumstance around 
by letting people participate in what Canada is as a country. If we start from that premise, we're already in a better position. So the payoff is how much do we let people be themselves? You want to say anything, Jake? All right. Any last words from uh, either of the speakers? No? Only the only, about circles. I can't let that go because <laughs> it's expensive to build a circle. And there's an economic reality that the system, the industry is used to building a box and a square and being creative and designing something and building something that's more free form, it's a challenge I, I would and say it's expensive. To, to Tom's point, it, it may be a, a discussion that would be more appropriate in a community center uh, or a gathering space than in, in housing per se. Uh, you know, we've learned so much working with Mark this year, um, and you know, especially when we're dealing with affordability issues in the urban context. Form, it just doesn't get into it. I mean, we're we're way way low on the pyramid, um, and so we're working at a much more uh, at a different level there. I think when we first engaged Mark, and this was been last year, we kept saying, "Tell us what's unique about the community. We want you know, we're we're really good at doing custom design. We'll do custom designs that are perfect for the community." And, and backed off that immediately and realized that, in fact, uh, the needs of the community are really fairly basic uh, safety, um, the ability not to be on the street and just have a place to, to be, uh, the ability to not necessarily be um, um, always forced into shared living situations where there are opportunities for conflict, but to have the ability to, to, to live in one's own self-contained unit. Uh, there, there are really key things there that, that need to be addressed. My particular perspective is that we really have to find a way uh, to link the indigenous community with a larger, not only not-for-profit community, but for the for-profit community so that we can actually increase the supply and address the affordability uh, uh, going forward. So those are, those are my particular thoughts on it. Mark, did you want to respond to that or? That's okay. No, only I, I think everybody expects there to be one answer or one big thing that's going to change. And the reality is that if we're going to learn differently, you're all part of the change. It's going to be a million little things that make a difference. And how you think, and where you work, and where you're learning, and how you apply that um, is going to be the examples that create something different and something better. Um, and we're all going to be better if we're more inclusive. Um, the situation that Indigenous people find themselves in today didn't happen overnight, and it didn't happen in isolation or alone. And if we're going to get out of the circumstance that we're in right now, we can't do it alone, and it's not going to happen overnight. So once again, we need each other. Well, I, I actually ask, I would like to ask for a round of applause for all three of our speakers. Thank you all. Oops, thank you very much, all three of you, for participating. David, it was fantastic to have you come all the way in from Waterloo today. And Mark and Jake, we're so glad you're here. Uh, and let's hope we can continue this conversation. We did hear that Alfred Waugh will be our last speaker in the series, uh, who's been also an Indigenous architect based in BC, uh, won a Governor General's Award recently for a, a Reconciliation Center. Uh, but we actually have Jim Mountain, I think others on our faculty, uh, Johan Vordau, are working also on issues of transforming uh, residential schools into recreation, recreation reconciliation centers. Uh, and so there's a lot, lot going on right, right here in our own community, which is fun to talk about. So great. Thank you guys for participating in the beginning of this, and we'll see you in next lecture.